Hey, Roberta, what's black and white and red all over? Ooh, opening the show with a joke, Dr. Z. I like where this is going. Any guesses from our friends at home? Ooh, I'm hearing some good ideas. Creative. Okay, let me see. Black, white, and red all over. I think I know this one. A panda eating strawberry jam. Oh, wow, that's a good guess. And that could be the answer, but I was thinking of a sunburned zebra. Oh, you got me there, Dr. Z. Well, Roberta, get your sunscreen on because we're about to take you and all our friends out there to the beach. Well, virtually, of course. And we're going to have a zoo chat with our good friend, Otter the Otter. He's already at the beach and he's expecting our call. Oh, I'm so excited to see Otter again. And I cannot wait to see the beach. Should I make a round of hay smoothies? Oh, gross. Uh, thank you, Roberta. I'm still full from breakfast. Otter, as I live and breathe, my good friend, it's so good to see you. There you are. Yeah, I know. The waterfront lifestyle suits me. Always has. I mean, look, the weather is perfect. I look excellent. And the water is a chill 62 degrees. I don't know why you two aren't already packing your bags to join me, bruh. Well... Otter, my bags are already packed. I'm ready to come to the beach, and I'm just hoping you won't mind if I bring my good friends with me. Whoa! Pump the brakes there, Dr. Z. No way am I having those six-legged terrors crawling on me. No way. I, Otter the Otter, am a no-bunk kind of guy. That's why I hang out here at the beach. See? No bugs! Well, Otter, I hate to make waves, but I just wanted to let you know, being a bug expert, that there are indeed bugs at the beach. You gotta be squidding me, Dr. Z. No way. No, never. Zilch. Uh-oh, it looks like we've lost Otter. Well, I guess he didn't like hearing the news that there are indeed bugs on the beach. Not to worry, Dr. Z. I'm sure we'll have our connection back up and running soon. But let's give our audience a proper introduction and dive headfirst into this week's episode. Oh, you're quite right, Roberta. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of San Diego Zoo Kids Corner. I'm Dr. Zoo Little. You've met Roberta, and you've met my BFF, the Madagascar hissing cockroach. This is Bruno. You won't believe the stories and tales I have to tell you. So let's explore the animal world together. Come on, everyone. Buckle up. Bruno, get your seatbelt on because we're about to bring the zoo to you. Okay, Dr. Z, I have to admit, I'm feeling a bit confused about whether there really are bugs at the beach. I mean, I know you're an expert on bugs, but Otter seems to know a lot about the beach. Friends at home, what do you think? Have you seen bugs at the beach? Oh, really? Oh, wow. Dr. Z, our friends at home have some interesting observations. When we're talking about bugs, we're talking about invertebrates, animals that don't have a backbone. The world is full of invertebrates. And in fact, the ocean has an astounding number to explore. Ah, I see. Okay, so let me see if I have this right. Your cockroaches have no backbones, so they're invertebrates. But, Dr. Z, your cockroaches live on land. And you said there were bugs at the beach? Correct, Roberta. The cockroaches are classified as arthropods. And arthropods have got segmented bodies, they've got appendages with joints, and they've got an exoskeleton, skeleton on the outside. Now let's look at the lobster. The lobster has got a segmented body, it's got appendages with joints, and it's got the exoskeleton. So to me, the lobsters are the cockroaches of the sea. Did you hear that, Bruno? You're related to the lobsters. <laughs> wow, Dr. Z, this is amazing. They have such similar adaptations, but live in very different environments. This makes me wonder, 
What adaptations do invertebrates have that allow them to survive in the ocean? You know, Roberta, Olivia recently visited with some incredible ocean invertebrates. Let's see if she can help out with this one. You and I are human beings, and we belong to a group known as mammals. We stand alongside other mammals like elephants, possums, wombats and seals. Yeah, OK, we may not look the same as our fellow mammals, but there are some characteristics that we have in common. For example, we all have a backbone. That backbone is what allows us to stand up and move around. But backbones aren't exclusive to mammals. Now, I bet you can think of some other animals that have a backbone too. Let's take a look. Birds, amphibians, reptiles and fish all have a backbone. So scientists place them into a group known as vertebrates. We vertebrates certainly make the most of our backbone. In fact, we are incredibly successful creatures. We get around by flying, swimming, climbing, walking and running. But what about animals that don't have a backbone? How do they get around without one? Well, today I'm taking you to Sea Life Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia to answer that question. We should probably start with the name of this group. What do you call an animal that doesn't have a backbone? It's pretty simple, really. It's the opposite to vertebrate, an invertebrate. And in my hands right now, I've got a pretty cool invertebrate. You may be able to recognise a few iconic marine invertebrates here. The sea star, the sea urchin and the sea cucumber. They all lack backbones. But trust me, they're doing just fine without them. They are all so well adapted to their environments and successfully inhabit oceans at various depths and climates around the world. And they don't need the help of an internal bony structure to get themselves from one place to another. Take a look at this. They have numerous rows of tiny little tube feet that work together to move their bodies along the surface of the seafloor. They may not be as fast as some marine vertebrates, but their method of locomotion is still effective. Just around the corner at Jellyfish Kingdom, we have come across some more marine invertebrates, and these guys certainly have their own unique way of moving around. Most jellyfish use jet propulsion to move through the water. They squeeze their bodies and push jets of water from the bottom to move their bodies upwards. They are also happy to grab a lift to their next destination by using the help of the ocean's currents. Well, there you have it. We've met some pretty impressive marine invertebrates that have proven that you don't need a backbone to get around in this world. You see, Roberta, you and I are vertebrates. We've got a backbone. Kids, let me show you where yours is. Take your hands and put it all the way behind your neck and you're going to feel your spine goes all the way down your back. And my backbone along with some acrobatic training, has allowed me to do this. All right, Roberta, and your backbone allows you to run fast around your habitat. But our friends, the invertebrates, the animals without a spine, have to figure out how to move in a different way. OK, this is all starting to make a lot more sense. I think a round of trivia is going to help with our invertebrate intelligence. Hello everyone, my name's Xavier and I'm an x-ray expert over there. And people always say to me, hey Xavier, do you have x-ray vision? And I say, no, don't be silly, I'm not a superhero. I put my shoes on one foot at a time just like the rest of you. But people insist and say, Xavier, the x-ray expert, you're a superhero. And I say, mummy, stop talking like that, it's not nice. This is my friend Norris over here. He's got a backbone, so he's a vertebrate over there. I took old Norris over here to the amusement park. He wouldn't go on the, on the roller coaster. He didn't have the guts for it. So we went to the restaurant instead. He ordered some spare ribs over there. This is the trivia for the day. I'm going to give you the name of an animal and you're going to tell me if you think this animal is a vertebrate or an invertebrate. It's so much easier than all the other trivia because you either get it right or you get it wrong. It's a 50-50 chance of getting it right or wrong. OK, our first animal is the snail. Do you think a snail is a vertebrate or an invertebrate? Snails are invertebrates. And snails grow their own shells throughout their lives and are used for homes by other animals like hermit crabs after the snail dies. 
Spiders. Are they invertebrates or vertebrates? Spiders are invertebrates. Not all spiders spin webs, some dig holes. The legless lizard. Vertebrate or invertebrate? The legless lizard is a vertebrate. What makes this a lizard and not a snake? Eyelids. Snakes don't have eyelids, but this legless lizard does. Cuttlefish. Is it a vertebrate or an invertebrate? Cuttlefish are invertebrates. Cuttlefish are mollusks like clams and snails, but their shells grow on the inside of their body. This internal shell supports their body, but is not a true backbone. My next animal is the axolotl. Xavier, the x-ray expert, is going to examine the axolotl. Is it a vertebrate or an invertebrate? The axolotl is a vertebrate. Axolotls are different from other salamanders because they spend their whole lives living underwater. Those feathery things on the side of their heads are gills. The horseshoe crab. Is it a vertebrate or an invertebrate? Horseshoe crabs are invertebrates. Their closest living relatives aren't crabs at all, but actually scorpions. Scorpions? Horseshoe crabs are related to scorpions? Okay, I definitely think of scorpions and spiders as bugs, so maybe Otter is wrong after all. There are bugs at the beach. That's what I've been trying to tell you, Roberto. Horseshoe crabs, spiders, scorpions are all part of the same group called arachnids. Those are invertebrates with eight legs. Invertebrates are found all over the world in different habitats and at the beach. But yes, horseshoe crabs are fascinating. And to find out more about them, let's check in with our friend Sarah at the South Carolina Aquarium. We have a ton of incredible species here at the South Carolina Aquarium, but probably the most unique is the horseshoe crab. Here are five cool facts about them. Number one, horseshoe crabs have blue blood. And that blood contains special cells that can help fight infections, not only for the horseshoe crab, but for humans as well. Number two, horseshoe crabs are experts when it comes to sight. They have 10 eyes located all around their body, and some of those eyes act as light sensors. Number three, when horseshoe crab babies are hatched, they are the size of your fingernail. And they will continue to grow to up to the size of a dinner plate. Number four, Horseshoe crabs are not actually crabs. What? <laughs> In fact, they aren't even crustaceans. They lack antenna, and they are more closely related to scorpions and spiders. Number five, if they lose a limb at a young age, they can grow it back after they molt. Horseshoe crabs can molt up to one to two times per year. Well, what did you think about that, Roberta? What surprised you the most? Maybe that horseshoe crabs have blue blood. That has completely thrown me off. At first, I thought that was a little gross, but now that I think more about it, it's actually really interesting. What about you, friends? What surprised you the most? Ah, huh, yes. <laughs> I was surprised too to learn they had 10 eyes. That's what I call some super sightseeing. Well, you know, Roberta, the animals in the ocean have got some weird adaptations. Weird, wonderful, and oftentimes gross. And this is where my identical twin brother is going to show you the amazing facts about those animals in a segment we like to call All About Ew. Hello, Dr. Zulil here with an ootastic science experiment. You see what I did there? Fantastic. Did you know that different levels of the ocean have different names? Yes, so like uh, there's five different levels. They're represented by uh, the common name of sunlight, twilight, midnight, abyss, and the trenches. Now, their uh, scientific name is epipelagic, mesopelagic, bathypelagic, abyssopelagic, and hadopelagic. 
Now, we're gonna do a scientific experiment to see if we can layer different liquids to create the different levels of the ocean. So for this experiment, I have five different liquids. This happens to be balsamic vinaigrette. Delicious. This one here is syrup, syrup. I also have um, green food coloring in water. We always love our food coloring here. And um, this is oil, common oil. Uh, this is canola oil, but you can use any kind of oil. And uh, then we have rubbing alcohol. Okay, now the other things that you'll need are a jar, a jar, and a spoon. You'll have to have your parents help you. Now what I did was I heated up this side of the spoon a little bit, heated it up, bent the spoon, and then dipped it in cold water so that I have an L-shaped spoon. Okay, let's try to layer the water like the ocean. Okay, we're gonna start with the um, balsamic vinaigrette. We're gonna go ahead and just pour that in. Since it's on the bottom, we do not need the spoon. There we go, fantastic. Now we are going to try to layer the, um, the syrup on top of the balsamic vinaigrette. The next one, this is gonna be really tricky. We've got our um, food coloring and water. Now for our fourth layer, we're going to use the oil. The oil. We are going to add the alcohol, rubbing alcohol. So this is an illustration of the ocean layers. One, two, three, four, and five. Now the scientific names, epipelagic, which is where you'll find the horseshoe crab, which has blue blood, like we talked about before. Interesting fact. All right, um, the second layer is called the mesopelagic zone. Now, uh, in the mesopelagic zone, you'll find the vampire squid. Now, a cool thing about the vampire squid, they have these uh, filament, filament where they use to uh, collect and eat marine snow, which we all know is uh, ocean boogers. You. The third layer is our bathypelagic zone, where you will find the jellies. A uh, cool fact about them is they eat and poop from the same hole. Ew. Ew. Disgusting. Um, then we get down to the abyssipelagic zone. That is where you're going to find the sea cucumber. Did you know something, um, a good fact about the sea cucumber is that they can breathe through their butt. Yeah. And then last but not least, we are at the Hadopelagic Zone, and uh, there you will find uh, sea stars. They can expel their stomachs from their bodies to catch prey. Ew. So weird. Sea stars, they will go all the way from the Hadopelagic Zone to the, uh, um, to the Abyssopelagic Zone, to the Bathypelagic Zone, to the Mesopelagic Zone, all the way to the Epipelagic Zone, so you can find them in all the zones. Thank you, and that is your Eurific Facts from Dr. Zoo Little. Wow, I cannot believe how well those invertebrates have adapted to life underwater. You would think daily life without a backbone would be tough, but they have got it all figured out. I can't believe sea stars are found at every depth of the ocean, even the deepest spots. And what about those vampire squid eating deep sea boogers? I thought only my smelly brother Robert ate boogers. And how about the fact that jellyfish and starfish are not fish at all? In fact, scientists are calling them jellies and sea stars. But speaking of jellies, Olivia has the perfect craft to help us pay tribute to some of our favorite ocean-dwelling invertebrates. Let's take a look. Today, we're going to be making secret jellies. Why are they secret? We'll get to that in a moment. So what you're going to need is a piece of white cardboard, some watercolors, a paintbrush, a little bit of water, and here's where the secret reveals itself, a white crayon. Now, white crayon and white cardboard doesn't sound like much, but once you go over it with your watercolors, it will reveal those secret jellies. 
Step one is to start drawing your jellies. Now, it might be a little bit hard to see what you're doing, but if you get your eyes on the right angle, you'll be able to watch where your crayon is going. All right, I think I'm done. I've done one, two, three, four, five jellies, which will reveal themselves in a moment now for the fun part. Grab your paintbrush, wet it, and select your first watercolor. I'm gonna go with green. And what I like to do is mix up my colors as I go. So you get a nice little multicolored watercolor background. Now, do you see why they're called secret jellies? You can always use this method to write a message as well and have your friend use their watercolors to reveal it. I think we can see all five of our jellies. Can you see them? One, two, three, four, five. All of our secret jellies have been revealed. Oh yes, here we go. The best part of the day. Where's my stage? Where's my microphone? Where is the highly energetic crowd? There they are. Okay, here we go. Where can you find an ocean with no water? On a map. What did the beach say when the tide came in? Long time, no sea. What does a mermaid use to call her friends? A shell phone! Do you know how crabs get around on land? They use the sidewalk. What did one rock pool say to the other rock pool? Show me your muscles. Kids, we need your help. Roberta's jokes are worse than dad jokes. I'm starting to think that zebra jokes are the worst kind of jokes in the world. Please send your jokes to zmail at sandiegozoo.org. Z stands for zebra and zoo little. Get in a grown up to help you. And if we use your joke on the air, we'll mention your name. You know, Roberta, you mentioned muscles in your last joke. And mussels are some of my favorite invertebrates. Those are the ones that are found in rock pools. And recently, our friend Olivia went to Caloundra, Australia. Let's meet the stars of that adventure. This is a rock pool, also known as a tidal pool. It's a body of water left behind by a receding tide. If you've ever had a chance to explore rock pools at low tide, you'll know that they are teeming with marine life. You just have to know where to look. Some of the more common creatures you'll find are hermit crabs, sea hares and sea cucumbers. These animals live in an ever-changing environment. And we're going to take a closer look at their adaptations to get a better idea of what it takes to survive in their world. Today, we're exploring the rock pools of Caloundra off Queensland's coast in Australia. And it doesn't take long to discover one of my favourite marine creatures. Slow-moving, soft-bodied and herbivorous, this is a sea hare, commonly found in tidal pools around the world. You might be wondering how they got the name sea hare. Take a look at these tentacle-like structures called rhinophores. They stick up like bunny ears, which earned them their name. But you won't find these guys hopping from rock pool to rock pool. They have a far more, shall we say, sluggish method of locomotion. They move around using a large muscular foot, it may not be the fastest way to get from A to B, but this thick, strong muscle is perfect for moving across sharp, rocky surfaces safely. And you may have noticed that incredible pattern covering their bodies. It's one of the most impressive camouflage patterns you will find in these rock pools. Let's test that theory. How many sea hares can you spot? They're almost impossible to find, aren't they? I'll give you a hint. There's one right here. Believe it or not, but there are six sea hares in this rock pool. Now let's take a look at another soft-bodied rock pool resident. This is the black sea cucumber. It's a little obvious how these guys got their name. Their long tube-like bodies look a lot like a cucumber. And sometimes it's hard to tell which is the front end and which is the back end. But it does make it a lot easier to spot the front end of a sea cucumber when they start to feed. Check this out. They gather their meal using numerous tube feet that look like tentacles surrounding their mouths. 
Let's speed it up a bit. They're feeding on tiny particles of algae, microorganisms and waste materials. Their soft bodies allow them to squeeze into really tight spaces with ease. Another animal that's pretty good at squeezing into small spaces is the hermit crab. They are highly successful little critters. One of the reasons for their success, that portable home they carry around on their backs. As a hermit crab grows in size, it abandons its old shell and searches for a new one. Even if someone else is already in it. So why do they need a shell? This part of the hermit crab is called an abdomen. Unlike the rest of its hard body, this part of the crab is soft and vulnerable, so it needs to be protected. You'll notice that their abdomen is slightly bent, this allows it to fit perfectly into the curvature of an empty shell. How cool is that? But carrying around a heavy shell on your back all day can come with its challenges, especially when you've rolled the wrong way up. From impressive camouflage to portable homes and soft bodies to muscular feet, these marine critters are very well adapted to the rock pool lifestyle. You know, Roberta, those sea hares were fascinating. I could barely see them. Their camouflage was fantastic. I'm even more impressed with how they get around. Did you see that slime all over their muscular foot? It's making me rethink my need for hooves and a backbone. These invertebrates are really quite remarkable. Exploring those rock pools can be a magical moment, Roberta. Dr. Z, this has been such a fascinating adventure. Exploring ocean invertebrates is kind of like visiting another world. I can't wait to share all that I've learned with Otter. So much of the ocean is left undiscovered. 95% of the ocean hasn't been explored yet. And I bet you, sitting out there in the audience somewhere, is a kid who is going to grow up to find some new ocean sea creatures. I promise you that. Otter, you'll never believe it. I know you're not a big fan of bugs, but it turns out they're just one group of invertebrates and they are definitely at the beach. And Otter, we explored sea stars, jellies, and crabs. Wait a second. You're telling me that I'm surrounded by bugs at the beach? Well, yes. Man, do you see any right now? I'm kinda bugging out. I just so happened to see two shrimp sitting right next to you, Otter. Huh? Where are you going? It's going to be okay. <laughs> well, I guess we've all learned to broaden our horizons this week. Otto learned that there are invertebrates at the beach. Roberta learned about the adaptations of those invertebrates and what helps them survive at the wild. And I learned that I need to get to the beach as soon as possible with Bruno over here. Isn't that right, Bruno? We want to meet some more invertebrates. You want to meet some more invertebrates, don't you, Bruno? We have come to the end of our time for San Diego Zoo Kids Corner. If you had fun, I hope you'll join us on our next adventure and tell your friends to join us as well. Keep the good jokes coming. Ask your grown up to email your suggestions, questions, poems, stories, artwork, and jokes to Dr. Z and I at zmail at sandiegozoo.org. It's easy to remember. The Z stands for zebra and zoo little. Keep asking those questions. See you soon. Stay curious, my friends.